Yeah, so now we're on record. Before I begin, I would like to find out if I'm audible enough. So can you guys hear me? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, beautiful. So now let me share my screen. Today we're looking at inductive reasoning. In our last class, we were discussing yeah. deductive reasoning. And we were saying that for deductive reasoning, it is a process of reasoning whereby the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is logical. Just like in mathematics, the meanings of the content of the argument of a deductive reasoning doesn't matter. All that matters is that you, you got the relationship between the premises and the co uh, conclusion correctly. So the argument can be valid whether it is true or not. For the argument to be true or not depends on the truthfulness of the content, the words in the, in the argument. So an argument can be valid, but it is not true. If it is valid and it's not true, then it is not sound. Uh, that means that deductive reasoning doesn't really depend on truth in order to be valid. All that they need for validity is just that they are, you know, you, you, they satisfied the rules of deductive reasoning. But for inductive reasoning, the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is not logical. So for inductive, it is possible to affirm all the premises and deny the conclusion without any contradiction. You know, we saw from our example of inductive argument, 95% of men are honest, Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest. We saw that there were two conclusions. There were two possible conclusions. Peter is honest, Peter is not honest. So that means any of those conclusions can go with the premises. So it is possible to affirm all the premises and deny the conclusion without contradiction. That's how you know that an argument is an inductive argument. Because the premises are capable of producing more than one conclusion. So if that is the case, you need to look at the meanings of the contents and then use your common sense to decide for yourself whether an inductive argument is um, closer to the truth or not, you know? First of all, inductive arguments are not strictly correct. So what you are evaluating is whether they are close, let's say whether they are close to the truth, not whether they are true, you know? So for inductive arguments, the premises provide reasons for believing in the likelihood of the conclusion. So that's, our description of inductive arguments. The premises provide reason for believing in the likelihood of the conclusion. But the premises do not guarantee the conclusion. So it is an argument of likelihood, not a guaranteed uh, argument. Inductive arguments are probability arguments. They are probability arguments. Uh, that will become clear as we move on. Now, because inductive arguments do not depend on rules, they are harder to evaluate. It is difficult, it is more difficult to evaluate the argument, 95% of men are honest, Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest, than it is to evaluate the argument, all men are mortal, Peter is a man, therefore Peter is mortal. If an argument has only one conclusion, there is no, you don't need any energy to evaluate it. It is simple, you are looking at two plus two equals four. But if an argument has more than one possible conclusion, then it is harder to evaluate, you know, for you to decide on which of the con possible conclusions that you find most meaningful. You need to, you know, do a lot, a lot of other considerations. You need to consider other factors, you know. Okay, so before we look at inductive arguments, let's do some clarifications. This one is a distinction between verifiable and confirmable statements. 
verifiable statements are statements we can directly test or verify. They are usually factual or empirical statements. For example, Kofi lost trend with age. Kofi lost trend with age. So that's a verifiable statement. You can verify whether Kofi lost trend with age because you knew how strong he was. You knew what he could do at the younger age and you as you've seen what he can do at an older age, so you have a sense of how much strength he has lost or whether he has lost strength at all. So Kofi lost strength with age is a verifiable statement. Then we have confirmable statements, statements that we cannot test or verify directly. Statements that we cannot test or verify directly except true verifiable statements. So, for example, all men lose trend with age. All men lose trend with age. You can't test it directly. You can only confirm or disconfirm it through uh, verifiable statement. So, it's only when you assemble some verifiable statements such as Kofi lost strength with age, uh, you know, John lost strength with age and all that. Those verifiable statements will help you to see, you know, to know whether you want to believe that all men lose strength with age. So uh, confirmable statements are not statements you can test directly. You can only use the verifiable statements to make a meaning of them, to decide whether you want to believe them or not. You know. So this is the combination. You have verifiable statements as premises and you have confirmable statements as conclusion. So the premises, which are verifiable statements are leading to the conclusion, which is an unverifiable or confirmable statement. So normally premises are verifiable statements and conclusion is normally confirmable statements. And by now you should begin to see the difference between uh, prem, uh, verifiable and confirmable statements. You should see how uh, verifiable statements are written. That's you should see the nature of um, verifiable statements, how they are. And then you should also see the nature of confirmable statements. Another example. Mary reached menopause by 40. Grace reached menopause by 35. Meredith reached, uh, reached menopause by 33. Rose reached menopause by 34. Edith reached menopause by 38. Sophia reached menopause by 45. So we have six, six verifiable statements. The conclusion, therefore, half of all women who reach monopause by 35. So that's the conclusion. So the conclusion is a confirmable statement. That is a kind of, you know, the conclusion is using the information it got from the, uh, the premises. Half of the women reached menopause by 35, half did not. So the conclusion is, uh, you know, is dependent somehow on the, on the premises. The confirmable statement is dependent on the verifiable statements. Now, how do you detect confirmable statements? There are two ways of detecting confirmable statements. First of all, they are not directly testable or verifiable. So I've mentioned that already. But second is that they can be converted into conditional statements. So for you to know if a statement is a confirmable statement, you should be able to convert it to a conditional statement. Example, look at this categorical statement. No leader steps down from power unless compelled by a coup or constitution. No leader steps down from power unless compelled by a coup or constitution. That's a categorical statement. Now convert it to a conditional, conditional translation. If X is a leader, 
then X will not step down unless compelled by a coup or constitution. So, because you can convert this statement to a conditional, it is a confirmable statement. So two ways of detecting confirmable statements is that first of all, you will see that you cannot test them directly. They are not directly verifiable. And secondly, they can be converted into conditional statements. Now let's look at another clarification that will help us in this class. The clarification, the distinction between finite and infinite reference classes. So we did this last week, and we're just repeating it. So we said the reference class is a, count, is a class of countable items. Examples, this copper, that man, some boys, that table, and so on. And then the infinite reference class is a class of uncountable items. Example, all metals, all men, all voters, and so on. Now, we needed that clarification because of this. There are two kinds of hypotheses. And I forgot to mention that the conclusion of an inductive argument is normally called a hypothesis. So for instance, when we saw this, when we saw this argument, six women who reached menopause by 35 or not, you see the conclusion. The conclusion is a hypothesis. We call it a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that you formulate and then you use experiments to confirm or disprove it. So inductive arguments are normally used in the sciences and their conclusions are normally called hypotheses. And when you look at the conclusions of inductive arguments, you see that those conclusions are technically hypotheses. Okay, look at the previous one, the previous example, all men lose strength with age. That's a hypothesis. You formulate this hypothesis and then you want to test it with experiments or then you start uh, you know, experimenting or gathering data. You gather data on four men and you notice that the four men lost strength with age. And then on the basis of that, you say, okay, therefore all men lose strength with age. So it's a hypothesis that was meant to be confirmed or disproved by experiment or data gathering or, or data. And so the data you have gathered are what constitute the premises. So the premises are just data. And then the conclusion is a hypothesis. Okay, so now, there are two kinds of hypotheses. That is two kinds of conclusions of inductive arguments. You have the law-like hypothesis and statistical hypothesis. The law-like hypothesis are those confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class. Remember that the conclusion of an inductive argument is a, com is a confirmable statement. The premises are verifiable statements. The conclusion is a, is a confirmable statement. So law-like hypotheses are confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class. This is the infinite reference class. Example, all metals expand when heated. So this is the conclusion of an inductive argument, or it can be a claim that is meant to be investigated, you know, inductively. All metals expand when heated is referring to an infinite reference class, all metals. So we call it, as a hypothesis, we call it a law-like hypothesis. It's a law-like hypothesis because it refers to all metals. It uses an infinite reference class. And then those uh, conclusions or confirmable statements that use particular reference class, finite reference class, we call them statistical hypotheses. Now, if you look at this example, all metals expand when heated. The, the conditional is if X is a metal, then X will expand when heated. If X is a metal, then X will expand when heated. Look at another example, all Fs are Gs. 
each F is a G. Not all Fs are Gs, all Fs are not Gs. You know, so these are law-like statements. They are law-like. Why do we call them law-like? They, they are law-like because they refer to all members of a class. So if you identify X as a member of that class, it means that X must, as a matter of must, share in the attributes that have been uh, given to that class. If an attribute is possessed by all members of a class, then anyone you identify in that class must possess that attribute. You know, so that, so that means the, the, pre, the predictability, the predictability of uh, you know, of, um, of, of that quality, that property that has been attributed to the members of the class, the predictability is law-like because it must apply to all members. If you say all members of a class possess something, then it, it must apply to all. Uh, so that is law-like. That's why we call, the, call it law-like hypothesis. But if you say that only some, some members of a class have a particular quality, then it is not law-like, you know, because some people, some people don't have it. A law is something that must apply to all, you know. So, uh, confirmable statements with uh, infinite reference class are law-like hypotheses. Now, the law-like hypotheses are highly predictive. That's the prediction power of Law like hypothesis is very high because if you say that all members of a class are tall and you say that John is a member of that class, it means that John must be tall. It must apply to John like a law. And so it means that anyone you identify as being in that class has a high predictability of being tall the predictability that anyone who is a member of that class is tall is 100%. So that's why we say law-like hypotheses are highly predictive. Now, statistical hypotheses are confirmable statements referring to some percentage less than 100% and more than zero. Example, 90% of those who ate the food fell sick. 90% of those who ate the food fell sick. That's a, that's a statistical hypothesis because it doesn't, refer, it doesn't refer to all members of a class. This one is not about all those who ate the food, it's just 90%. So some statistical terms include some, few, many, most, hardly any, typically, and all the rest. Now statistical statements are less predictive. They are less predictive. If X, if John ate that food, then John is likely to fall sick, but there's no guarantee that John will fall sick. Now, this is it. If 100% if of those who ate the food fell sick and John ate the food, then it means that the predictability of John falling sick is 100%, but if, 90% of those who fell this, uh, ate the food fell sick and John ate the, uh, ate the food, then it means that the predictability that John will fall sick is 90%. So the predictability of statistical hypothesis is less than the predictability of law-like hypothesis. The predictability is ranked along with the percentage that is given to members of a class that possess a certain quality. Then you have confirmation versus proof. Now, inductive arguments are aimed at confirmation. That is, you know, the, 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 you can only confirm, but the meaning of confirmation in, in this course is not as strong as the, the the way we use confirmation in, in real life. You know, in real life, we say confirmation as if it is guarantee, but in, in this class, in this course, confirmation is less than proof. It's, it's less than guarantee. So inductive arguments are aimed at confirmation. Deductive arguments are aimed at proof. 
confirmation is not proof. Now, um, if you say all men are mortal, Peter is a man, then Peter is mortal. That argument is a guarantee. It is guaranteed that Peter is mortal because all men are mortal. But if you say 90% of men are honest and Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest, the conclusion is not a guarantee. So inductive arguments uh, are not guaranteed. They don't provide guarantees of correctness. They, they are not aimed at proofs. When you say 90% of men are honest, Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest. The conclusion is, we, they say the conclusion is a confirmation, but the conclusion is not proof. It is only the conclusion of a deductive argument that is proof, but the conclusion of inductive arguments are not proofs. Evidence confirms, but does not prove, do not prove the truth of a hypothesis. So now let's look at the limitation of evidence. Um, in, in, in ordinary life, we think that evidence, evidence is uh, the end of an argument. If you provide evidence, then that's it. But in science, you see the limitation of evidence. So uh, I want to, uh, we're going to see shortly the limitation of evidence. Now let's look at two major ways to detect inductive arguments. How do you detect inductive arguments? First of all, they are capable of more than one conclusion. So we've seen that already. 90% of those who ate the food fell sick, Ama ate the food. So you have two possible conclusions. Ama fell sick, Ama did not fall sick. That's how you know an inductive argument. It's an argument that generates more than one possible conclusion. The second way of detecting inductive arguments is that inductive arguments are extrapolations. We call them extrapolations. An extrapolation is an activity that smuggles in information into the conclusion that is absent in any of the premises. An activity that smuggles information into the conclusion that is absent in any of the premises. So, all inductive conclusions contain information that is not accounted in the premises. Now, we're going to see that very shortly. Now, let's look at the technicality. This is why it is so. Now, let's uh, assume this. A known thing A has certain properties such as X, Y, and Z. Another known thing B that is not in the premises has the same properties, X, Y, and Z. Now, so A and B have the same properties, X, Y, Z. Now, A also has an additional property, Q. Now, on the basis of the above three premises, the argument concludes, or in reality extrapolates, that B also has the additional property Q. So if you see that two items, A and B, have three similar properties, X, Y, Z. And then because you see that they are alike in three, in three properties, you notice that A has a certain property you, do, you have not verified that B also has. A has Q. Now, so you are wondering whether B will have it. And then you decide that because A and B already has three identical properties, then B must also have this Q that A has. So the idea of induction then is that if B is like A in some respects, it may also be like A in other respects. But this kind of argument has no guarantee yeah, because uh, you are not sure where, whether because the two items have X, Y, Z, they will continue to have identical uh, properties that are different, you know. Now let's look at uh, the directions of extrapolation. Uh, this one is not in our syllabus, but I brought this from um, the textbook that is in the bookshop. Uh, there's this critical thinking textbook in the bookshop. It's colored red and black. So I brought this in from that book so that you will understand 
You, it, it will be easy for you to understand inductive arguments wherever you see them. So I will show you the different kinds of inductive arguments based on the directions of extrapolation so that whenever you see any of them, you know it's an inductive argument. First of all, you have part whole extrapolations, attributing something to a whole that constitutes a part or parts. We have two types. We have two types of part whole extrapolations. We have generalizations and we have statistical syllogisms. Now, generalization, Peter is strong, James is strong, therefore all men are strong. Peter is strong, James is strong, therefore all men are strong. Uh, so because two men are strong, you conclude that all men are strong. The problem is that all men, all men is impossible to know because uh, there are so many men that have lived and died and there are so many men that are yet to be born. So we can never have information on all men. You know, so this, uh, we call it a generalization, generalizing from two men to all men. Then we have the statistical syllogism. The statistical syllogism, most Canadian university students drink alcohol. Caroline is a Canadian university student, therefore Caroline drinks alcohol. So this one is like the argument that 95% of men are honest. Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest. You know, this one, instead of 95% uh, of Canadian university students, we use the word most, most Canadian university students drink alcohol. So you see, it's still a statistical, uh, it's still a statistical uh, hypothesis, or uh, it's still a statistical statement. Uh, so this is uh, a statistical syllogism, is a type of inductive argument. You can never be sure that Caroline drinks alcohol because most Canadian university students drink alcohol and she's a Canadian university student. So there's a chance that she doesn't drink alcohol because she, she, she could be among the very few who don't drink alcohol. Then we have analogies. Some inductive arguments are in the form of analogies, arguing that something possesses the same thing as another because they both possess some other properties. You know, analyzing from one thing to another. Example, the structural adjustment program was good for Cameroon, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Uganda, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Senegal, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Nigeria, which is a third world country. Therefore, the structural adjustment program must be good for Togo, which is a third world country. Now, so there are a few countries here. They have a particular similar property or quality. And then because they have the same similar quality, you think that something that, ha that something that happens in one or some of them will also be the same in others. You know. So what is the quality that these countries share in common? What, what is the quality they share in common? Can someone answer that? Okay, so they are third world countries. Now, the argument is that because this program worked in a third world country, it should also work in another third world country. So this is an argument by analogy. You know, arguing that because two things are the same in a particular respect, they could also be the same in another respect. You know. it's, it's just like saying that um, Peter is a tall man Paul is a tall man. Uh, Peter got married yesterday to a tall woman. Therefore, Paul is going to get married to a tall woman. You know, that's the kind of argument. 
Okay. Then you have predictions. Attributing a quality to a future event because of the level of frequency of past occurrences of the same quality in similar events. Attributing a quality to a future event because of the level of uh, frequency of past occurrences of the same quality in similar events. Tyson has won his last 30 boxing fights. Therefore, Tyson will win his next boxing fight. You know, so because a particular quality has repeated itself a good number of times in the past, then a conclusion is reached based on that. Uh, but it, it is possible that Tyson could lose his next boxing fight. So, so this is a prediction. A prediction is also an inductive argument. So you can see why predictions are not guaranteed, you know. So now we've seen the different directions of extrapolation, pathhood, generalizations, analogies, predictions. Now let's look at two kinds of inductive arguments based on strength. So two kinds of inductive arguments, or two kinds of enumerative inductive arguments. Now an enumerative argument is an argument with many premises. So it's like enumerating the premises like a list. So the first kind of argument are arguments or the first kind of inductive argument are arguments with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. And then the second kind of inductive argument are those with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. So let's look at the arguments with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. So this is an example. We have 10 premises. And then we have a summary premise and then we have conclusion. Gold expanded when heated, silver expanded when heated, bronze expanded when heated, copper expanded when heated and so on. So 10 different metals expanded when heated. And then there's a summary premise which says that all the metals tested so far, which is 10, expanded when heated. And then the conclusion says all metals expand when heated. Now, can you notice a gap between the premises and the conclusion? The gap is that the premises are all particular statements and then the conclusion is a general statement. So what it means is that we are reaching a general conclusion from particular premises. The problem with that is that there is an information that is missing in all the particular premises and that information is in the conclusion. So what information is that? The information is all men. So the information is information about all the members of a class. Remember that each of the premises is saying something about particular members of a class. Now gold is a particular member of the class of metals. Silver is a particular member of the class of metals. Bronze is a particular member of the class of metals. So you have 10 members of the metal class. These 10 members, they expand when you hit them. But they, so on the basis of those 10 expanding, the conclusion is that all metals, we are so all members of the metal class expand when heated. So what it means is that the conclusion is not strictly warranted. You can't reach conclusion on all members of a class because you tested 10 members. It is possible that you are missing something. So a jump from particular premises to a general conclusion is a sort of fallacious jump. So there is an information that is brought into the conclusion that is lacking in the premises. That information is the information about all members of a class. 
The conclusion, the premises alone cannot give you any information about all members of a class. So you'll be asking, why did that information come into the conclusion? Now, so premises one to 10 are verifiable and particular statements. The summary premise is the submission of all the verifiable statements. The conclusion is a confirmable or general statement. So the argument is strictly invalid. It involves jumping from verifiable to confirmable statements. And that is the reason why confirmation is not proof and inductive arguments are not valid. In fact, the conclusion is false. There are some metals that do not expand when heated. Yeah, we call them superconductors. They don't absorb heat, so they can't expand. So the conclusion is false and all the premises are true. So that's why we say it is possible to deny conclusion with all true premises or affirm premises and deny conclusion. So for inductive arguments, all the premises can be true and the conclusion could be false. Remember when we gave example of the, the first inductive argument, 95% of men are honest, Peter is, Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest. We said there are two possible conclusions. Peter is not honest is one of the possible conclusions. So Peter is not honest can go with the premises. You can say 95% of men are honest, Peter is a man, Peter is not honest. The argument is okay. So that's why we said it is possible to deny conclusion with all true premises or affirm premises and deny conclusion. And this is applicable to all the types of extrapolation from the parts hold to the analogies to the predictions. So we have finished describing inductive arguments. Now let's look at, uh, let's try to do some comparison between inductive and deductive. Let's see some advantages and disadvantages of each. Now, deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of the inability to provide information. So when you look at a deductive argument, the accuracy is 100%. It is as accurate as a mathematical equation but it doesn't provide you any extra information. For example, either it is raining or it is not raining. This is a disjunctive syllogism. Either it is raining or it is not raining. Now this argument is always correct. If it is not raining right now, the argument is correct. If it is raining right now, the argument is still correct. So whether it is actually raining or not, this argument will always be correct. But does it provide you any information about whether it is raining? It doesn't. So that's why we say deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of the inability to provide information. Deductive arguments don't really provide you with new information about the world. They just recycle old things that are correct. Okay. Look at the second statement. If it is raining, then someone will get wet. This is a conditional statement, which of course you are familiar with in deductive reasoning. If it is raining, then someone will get wet. This statement will always be true. Whether it is raining or it is not raining, the argument will be true. If it is raining, then someone will get wet. If it is not raining, then someone will not get wet unless he got wet through another means. So this statement is always true. There's no way you can falsify the statement, but does it tell you about whether it is rain, whether it is actually raining? It doesn't. So it doesn't give you any information that is beneficial to you. So that's why we say that inductive arguments are accurate at the expense of the ability to provide information. On the other hand, inductive arguments provide information at the expense of accuracy. So it is inductive arguments that can provide you information because information is normally smuggled into the conclusion that is absent from the premises. That is why inductive arguments can provide you with information. But the information they provide 
is falsifiable. It's falsifiable. Example, it is raining right now. This is an empirical statement. It is raining right now. So this statement tells you whether it is raining or not, but it is falsifiable. If it is raining right now, it is correct. If it is not raining right now, then the statement is false. So it means the statement is falsifiable. It could be correct this morning and then in the evening it will be incorrect. So any empirical information or any information about facts is a falsifiable statement. Now falsifiability and science, any valuable empirical information must be falsifiable. So any information that is trying to give you information about the real world is a falsifiable statement. You can falsify it. It is possible to be false or true. Any statement that is not falsifiable cannot be a verifiable or confirmable statement. So any statement that is absolutely true has no empirical content. Now, the more valuable the information, the more falsifiable it is. Now the empirical statement, it rains every third Friday of the month is more valuable than the information that it rained just now. How do you measure the value of an empirical statement? You measure it by what you can do with it, what you can use it to do. If, if you, uh, you get the information that it rained just now, uh, you, you can use it to do something, but if you get the information that it rains every third Friday of the month, it will help you to arrange your activities every third Friday. So that information is more valuable to you than the information that it rained just now, because it can help you to uh, uh, make more changes and to get more things arranged or done. But the more valuable, the more falsifiable. So that statement it rains every third Friday of the month is more falsifiable than the statement that it rained just now, because it will take only one third Friday of not raining to falsify that statement. Yeah. Now let's look at the second type of inductive argument. The arguments with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. This is an example. Uh, Zoom user, you don't have your name. You need to put off your mic, but let me put it off for you. Okay, so this is an example of um, an argument with statistical hypothesis as a conclusion. This is about vaccinating people for polio. Michael was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. Gilbert was vaccinated for polio and suffered polio. Mary was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. Stanley was vaccinated and never suffered. James was vaccinated and never suffered polio. Bob was vaccinated for polio and suffered it. G was vaccinated and never suffered. Samuel was vaccinated and never suffered. John was vaccinated and never suffered. Carol was vaccinated and never suffered. So the summary premise, eight out of 10 people who were vaccinated for polio did not suffer polio. So eight people who were vaccinated didn't suffer. Two people who were vaccinated still suffered it. So the conclusion is, Polio vaccination has 80% potential of preventing polio, 80% potential. So, so eight out of 10 people is 80%. So that conclusion is a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis and it is being confirmed by the, the premises. So that's an example of an argument with statistical hypothesis as the conclusion. So we have two types of inductive arguments. We have the ones ending with law-like hypotheses as conclusions and the ones ending with statistical hypotheses as conclusions. Now statistics, uh, hypotheses are technically regarded as conclusions of inductive arguments because they are confirmable statements to be supported or confirmed or denied by 
verifiable statements. So when you compare the law-like arguments with the statistical arguments, you see that the law-like arguments are a bit difficult to confirm. You can't confirm the statement that all metals expand when heated. But the statistical arguments are easier to confirm because you know it, it is more it is it is more moderate. It, it is a more prudent kind of argument. It is it's less ambitious compared to the law-like arguments. When you say that 80%, uh, uh, this 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 medicine has 80% chances of success because 80% of those who have received it uh, got well. You know, so that's a, a better, that's a safer way of making an argument compared to, compared to saying that uh, you know, 10 metals expanded, therefore all metals will expand. So this is the end of the class. Next week, we'll be looking at causal reasoning. At this point, uh, we should um, receive questions. Anyone who has questions to ask can ask, and then we address it. And then I will upload this video to your Sakai. So are there any questions? Junior. Hello, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, please, I want to ask if the... Yeah. The assignment, is there any scope for us as first uh, meeting up to today? Any what? I'm talking about the assignment that has been uploaded on Sakai. Is there any scope for the assignment? Oh, what do you, uh, I don't understand what you mean four. by scope. What do you mean by scope? You mean, do you mean time limit or what? I'm talking about no, the resource resource limit. Is it the first, second, third class, or from the first day up to up to now? Okay, you mean the scope, the scope of topics? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I think that covered our first, our first, and uh, possibly second classes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you have to. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's good. You have another assignment that will cover something else, and then you have an IE that should cover all the things we did before uh, deductive arguments. Felix. Okay. okay, okay. I asked that because, yeah, thank you. All right. Um, um, sir, please, um, my question is on definitions. Yeah. And it's on um, stipulative definitions. Yes. So uh, I want to ask, like, for the examples of stipulative definitions, like, um, yes, some slang like um, go up and things, and they mean it is a lot of cash. Can that one be uh, an example of a stipulative definition? Uh, repeat, repeat that definition. Um, I said. I was browsing the internet or even some rappers used to use words like guap. And then when you check the meaning, it is it means a lot of cash. That is to them, it means a lot of cash. Can that one be an example of a stipulative definition? Yeah, that's a definition. If it is not if it is not in the traditional dictionaries, then it, it is it's stipulative. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so that's it. I'm going to upload the video on your Sakai. Um, to do that, I will have to end the class. And, uh, and then I, we should be meeting on when, this is Wednesday, we should be meeting on Friday at the, at the same time. So by Friday, I hope to see you guys on Friday. So have a good time. Enjoy yourselves, but um, make sure you work hard. And uh, yeah. all of you are going to be great. Yeah.